Good morning. I hope all of everyone can hear me out there. Happy Monday. I'm John Parsons. I'm a pulmonologist here at OSU, and I'm a professor in the College of Medicine. And I'm very much appreciative that you guys joined on this Facebook Live event today. We're going to talk about a very important topic that certainly has wreaked havoc in all of our lives over the last few weeks. That's the coronavirus, or COVID-19 for short. Let me give you a little game plan uh, of what I, uh, in, uh, I'm planning to do today. First, we're going to talk about the coronavirus in general, and then I'll get down into the specifics of why this particular virus that we're dealing with is so dangerous. Then we'll talk about how the virus spreads, uh, what kinds of symptoms you might expect if you get infected, and then some at-risk groups that might be at risk for increased complications from the coronavirus. As we go along, please feel free to ask questions in the Facebook feed, and we'll have some time at the end to get to some questions and answers. Okay, so let's get right into it. Uh, what is the coronavirus? Well, the coronavirus is actually a family of viruses that typically reside in animals. And when they spread to humans, typically cause mild to moderate symptoms, similar to a common cold. I would venture to say that almost everybody who's listening to this feed today has been infected by a coronavirus at some point in their lifetime. But occasionally, the coronaviruses can spread from animals to humans and cause severe disease outbreaks. This has happened in the past before. Remember back uh, in the early 2000s, SARS? Uh, uh, SARS originated in China uh, from a cat and infected over 8,000 patients and 800 people died from it. And then about a decade later, we had MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, which obviously originated in the Middle East. Uh, its reservoir was camels and it uh, infected about 800 people, and unfortunately about 256 of those uh, died. So this was a very, uh, very lethal virus. And then when we fast forward to 2019, we have the coronavirus 2019 or COVID-19. And up to, day, uh, to this morning, uh, COVID-19 has infected over three quarters of a million people uh, worldwide, and it's killed 35,000. Here at home in the United States, 2,500 people have died from the coronavirus already, which is getting close to the number of people that unfortunately died in September 11th uh, tragedy. So this is a real deal virus that's causing a lot of problems, but why is, it, why is it so much more dangerous than the other viruses that we were talking about? Well, to answer that question, we need to go back to China in Wuhan province in 2019, where we think the virus originated in an animal market the index case patient got infected, and then after he got infected, two very important things happened with this virus. Uh, one is it mutated, and as a result of this mutation or change of the genetic code, two things happen. One is it developed the ability to be very contagious, highly contagious. How contagious are we talking? Think back to the forest fires we were watching last year. It's a good metaphor to think about when we're talking about how easily this virus spreads. The second thing that, that happened is after the mutation is it acquired an ability to uh, damage human lung with great affinity. So it has a healthy appetite for human lung. What does that mean? That means that yes, the vast majority of patients who get infected with COVID-19 are going to be at home with a mild to moderate illness, but there are patients that get infected that have acute lung injury. And when we develop acute lung injury, the lungs get swollen and edematous, and it's difficult for oxygen to move from the atmosphere into our bloodstream. You progress to respiratory failure, and then this is what most people are dying from, from this virus. A couple of other factors to keep in mind about the COVID-19 outbreak is it's novel. We have no immunity to this virus, so we don't have any of the bullets in our immune system that we usually use to fight off infection. Our body doesn't recognize this virus. In addition, we don't have a vaccine, and there is no, to date, FDA-approved treatment. So let's package that up quickly. We have a highly contagious virus that has a penchant for acute lung injury. It's novel, so we don't have any innate immunity against it. We don't have a treatment, and we don't have a vaccine. So that is really what you might describe as a perfect storm in terms of this virus. And it really explains why a lot of you who would usually be at work right now are at home in your pajamas watching me, because that's the only thing we have to offer in this case, in, in terms of treatment, is social distancing. So how does this virus spread? Well, it spreads by respiratory droplets. And so when you cough or sneeze, an invisible mist of droplets, which are chock full of live virus, 
go into the atmosphere. And it's been shown in studies that these droplets can travel around six feet. And that's the concept behind t social distancing, t keeping six feet between one another. So if you're within six feet of one of these patients who are coughing with coronavirus, you may inhale those respiratory droplets. They may land on your hands, and then you may transport it to yourself by touching your face. In addition, these droplets can land on inanimate objects such as doorknobs, phones, uh, toilet handles, remote controls, you, may, you name it. So the other strategy we really need to be implementing here is strict hand washing. Anytime you feel like you may have touched something that it's had the potential to infect you with coronavirus, you should be washing your hands. In terms of signs and symptoms, it, unfortunately, there is no specific symptom for COVID-19. Cough, fever, body aches, shortness of breath, those are non-specific symptoms you might get with any viral infection. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that about 20% of the patients that get infected with coronavirus are being admitted to the hospital. So 80% of you guys will stay at home and just uh, take seven to 14 days typically to overcome this. But those 20% of patients that get hospitalized, almost 40% of them end, end up in the ICU. So if you do get hospitalized with coronavirus, there is the pension for real risk here to end up uh, critically ill in the ICU. And then let's talk about at-risk groups. Uh, so you're hearing a lot in the media about uh, elderly patients, and that's true. And the definition of elderly is different for everybody. We're typically saying 65 and above are at, are at increased relative risk for complications. There's also the groups that have chronic lung disease, such as asthma, COPD, uh, chronic heart disease, congestive heart failure, comorbid conditions that depress your immune system. So if you're on auto, if you have autoimmune disease, you're not on medicines to treat that, or if you have a cancer and you're on chemotherapy, all these groups are at increased risk for uh, complications from coronavirus. The last thing I wanna say is that I don't want millennials, the 20, 30 somethings out there to think they're immune to this virus. We've seen tons of patients who have been admitted with coronavirus who are young and healthy. So please take the recommendations of social distancing and good strict hand washing seriously, uh, even if you're not at one of these increased uh, risk groups. So I'm gonna stop there and see if there's any questions. Let's see here. Question from Sherry, when should COPD patients consider calling their primary care providers? So that's a good question. So if you feel like you have coronavirus, the first thing you should do is call your doctor, no matter what the symptoms are at that point in time. What we don't want you to do is drive directly to the emergency department or an urgent care, because you're gonna get populated around, along, uh, around a lot of people and the risk of transmission is very high. So if you're having any upper respiratory tract symptoms, whether or not you have an underlying diagnosis of, such as COPD, the first step is just to call your doctor and err on the side of caution. Six more questions here. Question from Carol. Is disinfecting groceries before taking them inside the house really necessary? I would advise that if you're buying produce, fresh fruit that people touch all the time in the grocery store, if and they may not buy it, yes, you should wash your produce, fr fruits and vegetables. It's up to you. The reality is that this virus does um, stay live on inanimate objects. It is, does stay live on aluminum, so it's not a bad idea to wipe down your canned goods as well, but it's not something where you have to disinfect everything you buy at the grocery store before you use it. I've also got a lot of questions about um, eating takeout food and or whether it's safe to, to order takeout, and the answer is yes. Um, if it makes you feel better, uh, go ahead and wipe down the packaging, but this particular virus is not very stable on styrofoam or cardboard. So you should be good to go ahead and uh, eat, the, eat your takeout food without any major precautions. A lot of comments. I'm trying to get some questions here. Question from Edwina, are smokers at greater risk? Yeah, smokers are at increased risk for most every medical problem. Certainly, this, since this is a respiratory virus, people who are chronic tobacco users are at increased risk for significant complications from, from COVID-19. 
really good question from John. How safe are you when you wear gloves and mask in public? So that's, a, that's an excellent question and I'm glad you asked that. There is no indication for a patient or a, anybody out in the uh, general public to be wearing a mask 24 seven. First of all, most of the masks you see out in the community are, are masks that only cover the mouth and, and nose. This virus is spread by respiratory droplets and if it gets into your eyes, you will be infected just as readily as if it was in your mouth or nose. So when you're wearing a mask with no face protection or eye protection, you're doing yourself no service. The other thing is when these masks, if you've ever worn a surgical mask for any prolonged period of time, they get moist and wet and you start to play with it a little bit. And then you're actually increasing the interaction between your hands and your face, much more so if you weren't wearing a mask at all. So for that reason, we really don't ask people to wear um, a mask. Now, if you're in a, pop, you're a, a profession where you're uh, a lot of, uh, you know, contact with people, so like a free clerk, a store clerk or something along those lines, it would be relatively reasonable to wear gloves in that particular situation, as long as you change them often and we're cognizant not to touch your face. But again, please do not wear masks out in the general public. The other thing it, I forgot to mention is we are at risk for shortages of personal protective equipment. And for the general public to be wearing masks that we need to use in the hospital makes our job a lot more difficult. Sorry, let me, a couple more questions here. Lisa asks, is the fever always there? Can you carry the virus and not be sick at all? Great question. Uh, we're not exactly sure what the incubation period of this virus is. So the incubation period refers to the time that you actually get infected with the virus till the time you actually become symptomatic. So yes, it's very likely there are patients walking out in the general public that, are, that have coronavirus that have zero symptoms. That being said, once you become symptomatic, fever is a key, key symptom in this virus. It's very unlikely that you're gonna have systemic coronavirus infection without a fever. So that is a key feature. Question from Megan, if, we're, if we assume everyone is positive, then shouldn't, we, shouldn't those of us intubating patients always wear an N95? Good question. So the recommendations from the CDC currently are N95 masks are indicated for aerosolized procedures such as intubation in patients who are known to have COVID positive uh, or a rule out COVID in the hospital. The good news is on the inpatient side, we have excellent testing now that we can determine whether or not a patient is COVID positive within 12 hours here at Ohio State. So the likelihood that we will be intubating you uh, and not know definitively whether or not you are a COVID positive patient is very small. So at this point in time, general uh, face shield and surgical mask is, is okay for a general intubation. If you know they're COVID positive, however, you should be wearing an N95. But time for a couple more. Question, is it possible to become reinfected once you, were, once you were initially infected? We don't know the answer to that question definitively. The virus hasn't been out long enough to make that determination. There are some discussions about using the, the serum from patients that have been previously infected to tr uh, transfuse into patients who are infected to try to get some uh, immune response. But the answer is, my, we don't know. And my suspicion is that this coronavirus will be similar to influ annual influenza virus, that there will be an annual battle with this going forward. And that was why it's so key that we develop a vaccine here as soon as possible. Question from Wyatt, are you guys taking substantial precautions at the Wexner Medical Center for the employees? Absolutely, any, any um, provider that's faced in, uh, in, in front of a patient with COVID-19, uh, or rule out COVID-19 has uh, got the appropriate personal protective equipment available at all times. The good news here at OSU is that we're okay on our supply of PPE, PPE currently. That's not to say that we're not cultivating a culture of conservatism here, but yes, we have adequate supply of protective equipment at this time. Okay, we'll finish with this question. When will the transmission be diminished and once the quarantine is done. So let me answer that in this way. So I don't anticipate that the quarantine uh, is gonna be 
gone anytime soon. Uh, we anticipate a surge of cases here in Ohio uh, in roughly the next four to six weeks. So I anticipate that we'll be continuing our lifestyle like this for some time. And if we don't do that, then we're going to have a massive surge, such what you're seeing in New York City, that's going to overcome the healthcare uh, industry to the point where we are unable to take care of all these patients at the same time. Okay, I think we'll we'll wrap it there. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow, I believe at 10 a.m. We'll talk uh, about more of the signs and symptoms of one to become concerned. Uh, I really appreciate you jumping out and have a great Monday. Thanks a lot.